Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So, in continuation of our summer farm tour series, today we are once again hanging out with Yoko and Alex of Osawaga Farm in Connecticut, discussing their hedgerows and cover crops, how they plant and manage both of those things, plus some of the challenges that come with each. If you enjoyed this video or any of our videos, consider supporting our work by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook, where we dive deep into some of the technical details on no-till practices and things like cover cropping. And when you pick it up, at notillgrowers.com. The proceeds go to things like sending my partner at no-till growers, Jackson Rollette, up to film some of the best no-till farms in the country and share that with you like this. So check that out. Otherwise, enough from me. Let's get into it with Yoko and Alex of Osawaga Farm. <laughs> Introduce yourself. <laughs> so I'm Yoko Takamura. I'm Alex Carpenter. And we own and operate Asawaga Farm. It's like borderline crazy, like how much cover crops we, <laughs> we grow. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things we can talk about later, but let's do the hedgerow first, because that's okay. more simple. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when we built the deer fence, we specifically left uh, about 20 feet of space, 15 to 20 feet of space on the east side and on the south side we have another extension and we, we really wanted to put perennial um, trees, shrubs, uh, pollinators in. Um, we really, looking at, at farms like uh, Frith Farm does a lot of hedgerow stuff, um, the idea of providing a habitat for all of the predatory uh, insects, the pollinators, um, snakes, toads, all of the, the, the good guys, because this space, uh, we're not going through with a tractor, but it's constantly being turned over. It's constantly changing. A lot of these things, we're not really growing flowers out here. So like a lot of pollinators aren't coming in. So yeah, we, we wanted to, it's all about doing something incredibly unnatural and trying to replicate nature as much as possible, right? It's kind of a conundrum because your farming is like, this is not natural, that's natural, right? And we want to connect that biologically speaking, um, ideologically, everything. So I feel like this is bringing that in closer. We've got- It's uh, like a halfway point. Yeah, exactly. We've got <laughs> uh, in this, this bed that you see stretching down, we've got 26 different species of uh, native, like mostly East Coast, Northeast uh, pollinator plants. Um, Yoko is being crowded by the Columbines and the Golden Alexanders here. And then behind that, we had the idea of doing kind of like a, a native mini orchard type of thing. Um, and it's also a testing ground to see what grows well, because eventually we do have 23 acres here, but we're only farming on about an acre. And we've got maybe five and a half acres of open fields between the front field and back here. And we don't want to transform all that space, but we would like to be a little intentional with um, like a loose orchard, fruit trees, nut trees, things like that. So in our hedgerow, we planted hazelnuts, we planted uh, bush cherries, we've got some uh, elderberries behind us that are about to explode, um, aronia, blueberries, we planted hascaps this spring and june berries. Um, it's been, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice place on the farm where you can just like step a few inches over and be surrounded by all of these pollinators, all of this life, all of this activity. And because they're native, they can tolerate these extremes that we're having to a, to a greater extent than a lot of our annual crops that we're growing. For instance, when the aronia was blooming, it was covered in pollinators. It bloomed really early. We had a deep freeze just four weeks ago May now. May 18th. May 18th, a day that will live in infamy. Got down to 26 here. The aronia, flowers are open the whole time, they didn't care. So the pollinators that emerged early, um, they had something to eat because everything, all the flowers that are on the field, they're, they're getting burned, our crops are getting burned, but it's, it's like what I was talking about with being more resilient. I feel like this gives not just us, but the other creatures that inhabit this space a bit of resiliency. Um, so we feel really good about that. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, you do spend, you have to spend at least the first few years <clears throat> You know, you're tending to the weeds and everything, and it's hard to commit that kind of time to farming because there's no direct like link to sales or anything. But we do plan to sell these at our plant sale as native plants or take cuttings from the more woody stuff um, and sell as 
trees and plants. So it should make some money off of it. So it's not just purely for our, you know, enjoyment. And I guess we can talk about quickly just how we broke it. So we left the space with the, the deer fencing and we tarped it for a year. Um, we took it off. Actually, the southern one we did a little bit differently. We, we had it tarped. Once everything had been mostly killed, we put down cardboard and put compost on top of it. And then we planted a really dense cover crop into it and we let that go for a season. So this was just purely tarped. That one we did a cover crop. Um, the interesting thing is <laughs> the tarp one di is doing really well, if not better than the, the one the with the cover crop. crops. And we put so much more time into the, the one that we prepared for the cover crops and yep. so much time. So <laughs> another experiment, another. Yeah, it's just it's just interesting. It was mostly just looking at what was um, native or or semi-native to this area. So a lot of these plants we got from uh, Prairie Moon Nursery. You can find them online and they're great. I think they work with the Xerces Society. Um, they break down by region. You can search. Uh, they sell seeds, they sell plant starts. And so going through there, we just started to build this list and we just wanted as much diversity as possible. Just like with our compost, our microbiology, everything. We just want as many things as possible to be feeding the soil in as many different ways as possible. And yeah, I mean, we came up with a list of like 30 and we were like, eh, okay, well, it just made sense to, to do the number that we did, but. Cause it came um, in like, you know, sets of whatever. Yeah. But it's, it's awesome because they come in waves, you know? Um, not everything is blooming at once. There's the stuff that comes out early, the stuff that goes really late, and then all different times in between. Yeah. That's another thing you can search for on there is like bloom time, so you can really dial it in. This was really like a, it was an investment in the farm, but like Yoko said, it's not, it's not like directly related to our sales, but it was kind of like an offering to the the things that also exist here, you know? Oh, I mean? we should mention that we did get NRCS <clears throat> money for the plants that we purchased. Mm -hmm. So that we didn't, didn't come out of our own pockets. So. Yep. I know I didn't like harden those winter squash off because I was like, oh, it's cloudy for the next mm -hmm. however many days. And they're <laughs> all like, oh. Do you want to start with the hesgerow then? Sure. So this was the one you were talking about, the first one. Where we you like you prepped, cover cropped, cover cropped, yeah. Yeah, sheet composting. That's how oh, we yeah, broke this with one. The... Yeah, even with compost. the cardboard. I mean, that was needed a lot of cardboard. Yep. Yeah. yeah, can't say it grows any better than the other one. So. <laughs> <laughs> but not any more weeds or anything. It was just a lot more work for a similar outcome. Yeah. So, um, I... I, I think tarping is more than acceptable over there what we did was we tarped and then we put down a bunch of compost and then we planted into it and then after one year of weeding anything that came up we put wood chips down so i wouldn't recommend putting wood chips down or mulch down until you've you've allowed everything that's going to germinate to germinate because it makes uh, weeding a bit harder Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, now, now we'll sweep through this like every couple weeks, but there's barely anything coming up anymore. Um, the first year there was quite a bit of grass that was coming up, the rhizomous grass, but we just like with anything and it's nice on this small scale, you can just wear it out. You just, mm -hmm. just keep picking it. Don't let it photosynthesize. Don't let it flower. Yeah. We and, had a uh, pretty intense bindweed, um, coming up opening up some of our fields on the edges. They're just all over the place. So easy to remove. Mm -hmm. You just have to be really- uh, Militant. Militant every single, I think it was, I guess, twice a week. Mm -hmm. Go up and pull up any um, leaves that are coming up and, and then they run out of steam and they eventually die. So it was very fast to remove the bindweed. I mean, of course, if you're on a, you know, you got an acre field and the whole thing is bindweed, that is a whole nother problem, but- yeah. But that's what the one year of tarping is supposed to at least like push back um, a bit of the, yeah. The mm -hmm. And as long as you're not um, breaking up those rhizomes, as long as you're not tilling, it's, uh, you know, 
throw some throw some hands at it and then you won't have to worry about it anymore so like it's a like with anything with no-till it seems like a lot of upfront investment and then a few years later if you keep up with it it starts to ease and then you can transfer your focus to other things so people come to our farm and they're like wow you have no weeds that's amazing and we tell them how we did it and then they'll put down a tarp for a couple of months and be like oh it's not really working so we just took it off and tilled it and it's like <laughs> <laughs> gotta trust the process man and then and then you'll be at this stage in a few years you know yeah so i mean some farmers don't have that luxury they don't. Of, that's true that's but true. we you know we kind of put that into our calculation when we start at the farm like get our property tarp it for a year that was already in the equation yep. so so these are our hazelnut trees um and we've got some bush cherries there's we've got a few crab apples spread around with the uh, narcissus around it um, yeah, so we have blocks of the, the woody perennials that we put around. And then this is that same repetition of the 26 native perennials. This was kind of an experiment to see what does well, what doesn't. Uh, like these guys, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but they're obviously not as happy as these guys are. So um, we'll fill in holes as we go. Uh, and the nice thing is a lot of this, uh, we can propagate, we can move around, we can replace. So. Um, I'm amazed that as much came back as it did. We planted them in a yeah, pretty severe it's drought. It's just this section, literally, that the voles that took the voles out. Ran. Yeah. Everything else came back yep. and they look great. And some things were popping in like early April and some things are just starting to emerge now. So they, they know what to do. We're, you know, there's some things we're like, oh, that didn't come back. And then you walk by and you're like, oh, <laughs> I see something green. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a, a really, it's a nice place to be on the farm. Um, Forget about your annual vegetables. Yeah, you get frustrated over there and you come over here and you're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> they plant all of these things. Yeah. Yeah. They just come back. They just come back. Yeah. And they yeah. have pretty flowers. <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully in the next few years, we'll, we'll start to see some, some local nuts and some local fruits. And that isn't something we bring to our big market, but it would be nice to offer those things at our farm stand. Um, diversify a little bit. I mean, mostly it's for us, but if we have a bumper crop, sure, we'll share. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Cool, I mean, like I said, we do a crazy amount of cover crops. I mean, I don't know, I can't tell you 100% well, that it's totally worth it. But most beds on the farm have so at least two, every right? Every bed on the farm has at least one cover crop. Um, many of them have two. Even if there's a, our shortest one is our summer short cover crop. And that, you know, if we have a space of three to four weeks and we put that in, so a lot of cover cropping. Um, so for every part of the season, I have a different mix. So spring, um, summer short, summer long and fall, which is winter killed. And then the fall that is overwintered. So each one of those have anywhere from eight to maybe 11 or so species in them. And uh, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter what it is. I mean, we have like sesame and okra in our summer cover crops. So just as long as it's something different and you know, the seeds aren't ridiculously expensive. Um, yeah, we throw it in there. So here, um, of course, the spring one, we don't do the same as the other ones where we mulch and let it come up through the mulch. This, because we need the bed to warm up quickly in the early spring, we broadcast the seeds and then we sow oats and peas into it with the jang so that the jang kind of pushes the soil over and it just kind of makes better soil to seed contact. Um, so you see a lot of it is oats and peas, but you know, you see a bunch of phacelia here. Um, we have like fava beans and... Yeah, there's a fava bean coming up right here. Yeah, there's, we uh, have... There's some vetch you'll see maybe peeking out right here. Yeah. Some things obviously do better than others and are more concentrated than others, but... Yeah, and the oats and peas, yeah, they grow quite fast, so it might outcompete some things, but... The, and the peas, we actually sell quite a bit of in the spring as pea tendrils, and so, you know, it's a... makes a little bit of money um when you don't have anything else so it's useful that way and how we terminate it is to um mow it and then solarize but that's one of the challenges that we're coming up against this spring because it's been so cool 
And usually we can totally count on there to be hot days starting after our last frost date. Um, but uh, the spring, it's like maybe once a week we have one sunny day yeah. that to, is uh, over 70 degrees. To solarize effectively, it really has to be like 75 and full sun, 75 or above. And looking at the 10 day, like we don't have any options to solarize in the next 10 days. We just had like one lucky day that we were able to fry those ones. Um, but the other ones you'll notice when we walk over there some of the oats are starting to grow back it just didn't take them out so that when they when it doesn't work out the way we we want it to it's kind of a pain in the butt yeah um, that's another thing we're rethinking it's like if we can't reliably terminate these and solarize these like should we keep doing it but one problem is that the oats are definitely too thick and so what does come up is the oats not anything else really so maybe the oats just need to be a little less, maybe not in a really dense row, maybe that'll help, so. Yeah, maybe we need to move, figure out a way to do more broadcasting and less with the jang. Um, but the reason we, we have so much diversity in it, like with other things on the farm, each of these species that we have in here are putting different root exudates into the soil and those are feeding different microorganisms. So in the grand scheme of things, with our obsession with soil health and microbiology, I can't imagine we're ever going to stop cover cropping. Mm. Um, we just need to figure out ways to make it work for us, especially with the changing climate. So last year, no problem. We could solarize. We, we never had anything grow back. It was just like one and done. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really nice when that happens, like this whole block, this whole field, each of our fields is uh, 16, 100 foot beds. This was all like this at the start of the season. Oh, well, that field too. And both fields were completely spring yep, cover crops. They're spring cover crops. So then what we do, we just mow down the first four, solarize them, plant into them. The next week we'll mow down the next four, solarize them, plant into them. So we just work our way right down the field. And when it works, it works really nicely. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> our employees probably can uh, attest to uh, how a little bit more challenging it is to prep a bed that had a cover crop just just die mm -hmm. so the when you're broad forking it's going to be stiffer when you're raking you have all the you know leftover debris that's like making it hard to rake so things like that it's not like and then when you go work on a bed that just had turnips come out it's just like ah oh. you know, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's really effortless nice. so there's definitely a little bit more like labor more yeah. you know and if you're I do all the direct seeding on the farm with the oh, jang yeah. and running through these beds with the direct seed, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but we have the double disc opener. It's the only way we can do it. And this year, I've never had to do this before. And maybe it's just because of this challenge of not being able to solarize as well. Um, I just put like a 20 pound dumbbell on the front of the jang and it really drives that front in and then I'm, I'm good. But I was getting really frustrated at the beginning because yeah. um, I just, the front wheel just kept popping out and I wasn't getting it spinning. Um, but that weight, yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, you can see up close that because of the, the three ro rows of oats that we have, that's like kind of the most like dense, most uh, like this part, this whole thing. Yep, right here. It's just so dense that it makes transplanting hard. It makes direct seeding hard. So you'll see when we go over to our summer cover crop and actually everything else is done that way where we just broadcast and, and then mulch and let it come through the mulch. That's way more just random, right? How it comes yeah, up. Yeah. So you're not having to deal with this really dense yeah. row of if we do something like carrots with four rows, I can I can miss these. I can put it just to the side, but arugula, we do seven rows and it, I have to go right, right through that root mat. And uh, <laughs> that weight is how to do it. Yeah. You guys know about this insect netting, the tech knit? Um, oh yeah, you gotta spread the word. <laughs> feel it, feel how heavy duty it is. Um, there's growers that I've heard of using this for 10 plus years. Um, the ProtectNet, this is what I've heard, the stuff that you buy from the seed companies, it's really expensive. It's not like actually polypropylene. And if you notice, it breaks down over the course of a couple seasons. It's like brittle. It's once really a, stretchy. Once you use it for it's terrible. And it's turning into microplastics and just, but you know, 
I think at one point this might have been called ProtectNet or something. Anyway, there's a manufacturer in Quebec that makes this. And we ran into him at the New England Fruit and Veg Conference a few years ago. And he told me the whole story. And uh, basically there's a, a farm in upstate New York that distributes it for them in the States. Uh, we drove out, or I drove out uh, just last week and picked up a couple new rolls. Um, it's honestly, I don't think it's any more expensive than the ProtectNet. And yeah, it's great. We, we hated that ProtectNet stuff. It was just crazy. It's crazy to make that investment too and only have it last as long as a row cover. So we're, we really like this stuff a lot. It's just heavy duty. It's, uh, it's awesome. Good, good stuff. So, um, so yeah, this whole field is cover cropped and we kind of did it, did it in different stages. So you'll see these two, we just sewed. So it's just maybe coming up. These four, we did it before that. And then uh, some of these are a little earlier, but these first four beds are our short summer cover crops. That's why you see like buckwheat in it. Um, we have like some um, beans in it, maybe sunflowers. Yeah, sunflower right there. Um, we always put in a bunch of grasses, you know, at least maybe 40% grass, 40 to 60% grass. So um, like millet and and then during the fall, we use like wheat and barley and obviously rye and oats and stuff. Um, yeah, so we just broadcast it, um, run over it with the, um, the bed roller, and then we just mulch on top. And it doesn't matter how it comes up. It doesn't matter if it's uneven, there's like some spots missing. It, it doesn't matter because it's mulched and it's protected. Um, and you know, if there's only one thing that comes up in a little area, then that gets to spread its roots and it's not a problem. And this is our longer season cover, uh, summer cover crop. So this has um, things like sun hemp and uh, more beans and more grasses. I can't remember the mix, <laughs> but. And this obviously doesn't have the density of those oats that are giving us problems down there. Mm -hmm. And it's also more likely to come up at a time when solarization is more possible. So um, when it was time to terminate this, we would just mow it down with our flail mower and then we'd solarize it mm -hmm. and uh, it, it shouldn't be an issue. Grasses like that will be taken out, but it's, yeah, it's when they're so dense like those oats were down there. Yeah. Um, they kind of keep the plastic up. They keep more air under it, a little insulation. It's, it's so fast. Yeah. Because then you get to use the bed the next day, you know? Yeah. So it kind of like maximizes the time, you know, um, yeah, you're not, we can you don't mow have that it to, I mean, if it's hot enough and it's clear enough, you can mow it the day before you need it, solarize it that afternoon and plant into it the next day. Like it can be that quick. It's pretty crazy. Instead of having to wait a few weeks or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, with um, crimping, yeah, you'd put a tarp down or something and that needs to be on for like, right. Well, it depends, I guess what the cover crop is and what part of the season, but maybe, maybe minimum two weeks or so. Right. So yeah, you're not losing out on the two weeks of photosynthesis in the ground. The only time, so now how we manage um, winter rye, because we do plant it in the fall, and when it comes up in the spring and it's still small, we'll put a black tarp over it. It helps yeah. to warm up the beds, it kills the rye. We had that photosynthesis all winter, mm -hmm. and it's too early in the year for things to move under it. So Yeah, I love that, because then it great. dies in three to four weeks. Yep. So. It's so much And we have the benefit of getting the biology moving because it's warming up the soil. Yeah, so yeah, it works. It works really soil. well for us. Yep. Yeah, yep. It's perfect. Huge thank you, if not downright enormous thank you, to Yoko and Alex uh, and to Jackson who filmed and edited this video. If you want to hear more about their design and about their fertility management, check out the video we put up last week on those things. And don't forget, you can always support our work by picking up a copy of, of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or a hat or other merch, or just go to patreon.com slash no-till growers and sign up. Or you can hit that super thanks button, that works too. Those actions that you wonderful humans take every week literally make it possible for us to make these videos. Otherwise, like the video if you like the video. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. We were doing two markets up in Boston. We were moving everything that we grew. And then we'd have local folks saying, where can we get your vegetables? And we're like, oh, it's, you can drive an hour, but that didn't <laughs> feel good, right? We want to feed our local community too. We live 
right above the farm stand. We live in a barn. Um, we just walk downstairs, we set it up, people come to us, and we've built a really cool community um, out of that. And, and like she was saying too, it really seems like it has unlimited potential.